and welcome to the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michaela, and today I have the pleasure to talk to Jess Rose. Jess is a technology professional and keynote speaker specializing in community building, outreach, and developing better processes for talent in technology. She is passionate about fostering more equal access to technical education and digital spaces. I'm super, super thrilled to have Jess here with me. Jess, welcome to the show. Oh, gosh. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here. When you said, hey, do you want to come and talk about teaching and learning? Oh, I'm just going to be insufferable. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm really excited because I'm following you on Twitter and I see that you're, you're, you know, you're, you are creating spaces for people to learn, to get better, to grow, right? So there are a couple of things that I want to touch base on to today with you. Uh, one is the one-on-ones that you're offering. And, oh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe let's get started with that because I see you from time to time. You say, you know, I have some time available. Why not hop over on a call and I can help you with some career advice? Um, how's it going? Uh, what what do you do with people there? Yeah. And what kind of people are, are oh, you know, taking gosh, you up yeah. on that? <laughs> So I've been doing this for about, um, I looked the other day because I do, I do keep records, Mm -hmm. privacy preserving records, just like, oh, what kinds of things am I talking to people about? Um, And I've been doing this for about eight years now. So just broke 1700 folks I've talked to over the years. Wow. And you would think, oh, it's going to be mostly juniors or mostly people trying to break into tech. Um, But just the absolute vastness of experience is so dazzling and exciting and strange to me. Um, I don't see myself as especially well suited to give great advice, but on these calls, people are almost never asking for actual advice. Mm -hmm. Um, so a lot, most of it's just, I'd like to be heard and I'd like someone to confirm that my experience is unusual or isn't unusual. Mm -hmm. Um, or getting sort of a level check for a different area saying, Hey, I'm based in this region and I'm looking for work in your region. What's that like? What's the experience like? What's the process like? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I actually documented the whole process out because I want, I definitely want other people to be doing this if you feel like it, no pressure. Yeah. And it's on my GitHub. So GitHub slash Jessica Rose, and it should be right on there as one-to-ones. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that on your in, on your Twitter feed. So it tells us how to do those one-on-ones and how to what questions to ask and so on. Yeah, and mostly just about the tooling. So how to get it scheduled, how to get mm-hmm. that sorted. And then because I'm a weirdo, how to get the records of who chatted to you deleted if you want to. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, I wouldn't keep notes on somebody who doesn't want me to keep notes. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's good for privacy as well, right? If people, I don't know which, which topics they are coming to you, but uh I mean, some of them might be private and, you know, especially if you're having maybe like, I think if you need advice, you're very often not a, not such a good place, right? <laughs> like, um, yeah. Probably more than being in a great place where you think, well, everything figured out, you know, things are going smooth, then you're solemnly reaching out to other people. Uh, it would be like, I'm bragging now to you. <laughs> you're more probably reaching out if you have some problems um, with, uh, with your team maybe or getting a job or something like this is that what people talk to you about in the, in these sessions so anything from hey am i getting paid right to oh i'm getting screamed at a lot at work is this normal so a lot of them are sort of oh gosh but a lot of times folks just want to explore what's going on next mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um i've managed people a lot in my career and one of the things that i always I always have a difficult time with, and I, I hope other managers do too, is how do you deal with the the conflict? And there's always going to be conflict between what's best to the individual person you're managing and what's best for the company, because those mm-hmm. are those. Um, and one of the big things I push when I do manage people is, hey, do you have someone external to the company to give you good advice when I can't or I shouldn't give you the advice that's best for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's a conflict, right? Yeah, because obviously you don't want to lose that person, but you see that they're Do you, you know, not? outgrowing, you know, maybe that's Oh, I'm willing to chase this right? up a minute. I'm yeah. always like, you don't want to lose somebody, like you don't want somebody to move on for your team because they were unhappy or mistreated. I'm, this is definitely from me being a teacher for too long. 
I'm always pretty excited when somebody graduates up out of a team I'm run. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, you want to make sure that people have space to grow. Of course, you want to be actively making sure there's career progression and more things to learn. But, and especially in a job market like right now, sometimes people are like, oh, cool, I could make a bigger salary jump or I could make a bigger title jump by leaving. And I'm always pretty chill with that. Yeah, yeah, uh, me too. And um, <laughs> my, my husband is also uh, managing a, a bunch of people. And But I see tension there, right? So uh, I think he's always really behind the people, but then upper management would be, yeah, but you know... <laughs> The business case for <laughs> yeah, retention. Yeah, exactly. Right. And the same for, for, for example, giving a raise. Right. Um, and, and I think especially maybe the managers, you know, that are really like first line, um, they are more for the people because they have like some personal relationship and then one level up, it's already like, yeah, but you know, we don't have the budget or we don't want, or we, we believe we can still keep that person, you know, for this for this cheaper. <laughs> oh, well, you know, let's give it another quarter or two and yeah, wait and see. Yeah, exactly, right? Baffling. Yeah. How, how do you do that as a, as a manager? How do you speak up for your, for your people, for your team? And, and how do you deal with that conflict as well? So I think that's, that's a really challenging one because I think that the, the conflict there is still the same. What do you do as an individual manager when the... Yeah, when your contractual or your fiduciary duties to your company run counter to your individual ethical responsibilities to, exactly. to the people you manage. Mm -hmm. And or what happens when there's a conflict between the needs of an individual and the needs of a team? Yeah. Um, and it's not a good answer and it's not a reassuring answer, but it depends. Um, if somebody's facing treatment that feels unfair or targeted or they're in a position that I generally, if somebody's in a position I'm not okay with, being much more lovingly strident around, hey, this is a this is a topic I would really bring to your external external mentor as well. Yeah. Um, and then setting really clear limits internally about what even as a manager you are and aren't willing to do. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's saying, oh, and you get the idea that, oh, maybe we want to manage so-and-so out. Go ahead and write them up for stuff that the rest of the team routinely does. You still have consent as a manager. So you could say like, yeah, no, I'm, I, I won't work in a space that involves maybe this kind of behavior. Yeah, yeah. I think this is really important that we are standing up for our own ethics and for our own beliefs and value and, you know, also behind our you know, our people that we, you know, I think we have a responsibility as well for, um, and yeah, so I, I, yeah, I can totally see that. So and it's, yeah, oh, sorry. No, no <laughs> go ahead. Gonna say, yeah. it's easy to say in this kind of job market in the West as well. Um, I think, are, are you based perhaps in Europe as well? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Cause like these days for many European job markets in tech, finding a new job feels to, to many people who are established. For juniors or people getting your first job, it is hard. But for folks who've been in for a little while and folks in different in high demand areas, getting a new job as a junior, as a as a middleweight or a senior is 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 not as difficult as it could be these days. Whereas if you're having to engage in management behavior that you're just not comfortable with, yeah, sometimes changing jobs is easier than making peace with uneasy ethical decisions. Yeah. Sometimes. That's not true for everybody. And it's a very, very privileged take for for the, those of us who have a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, I think so. And and it really depends on where are you located and what is your personal situation, right? Do you have dependents? Do you have like family or thing, people that you have Absolutely. to take care of and so on? Which I think makes it much harder to say, you know, I'm, I'm going to not do that. But I think there, are, you know, there are boundaries. It's, it's one thing is playing along and just, you know, um, or letting the other person also, you know, know in, in the space that you have, right. You're also like, as a manager, you also 
you, you can't just go and you know give advice directly conflicting with the interests of your upper management <laughs> because that you know is a problem but you can you know talk a little bit about as you said maybe asking an external person or also i think very well you can say i'm, I'm disagreeing with this decision right um and i advocated for you unfortunately you know these were my boundaries here for example and let them know i think that's that's perfectly fine um yeah and i think the, the problem is that if more of those things come together people start thinking about leaving right and um yeah. And that's not always a bad thing. If you're, yeah. as a manager, if you're not able to to offer someone a place that is safe and productive and non-traumatic to work, um, yeah, it's okay that your people move on and, and actually kind of preferable. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. So uh, another another topic that I wanted to talk with you about, and it's it's a little bit related to management, but it's more related to teaching. So I don't think you have to be a manager to teach, right? You can be, you can be, a, a, you know, a junior dev, a mid dev, a senior dev, right? Uh, so we can all learn from each other. But um, I really see you as a teaching, you know, expert here, Ooh, gosh. <laughs> because yeah, because you're you're bringing topics around programming but also you know advice for hiring or you know how to how to get hired um to so many people right you're you're also making this really mass um mass online learning events right aka online boot camps <laughs> um so so how is that going why did you start that and um, oh, is yeah. that only for really junior people so the first thing i want to do is like I would absolutely love if there was an excuse for me. Oh, yes, I'll just take all the credit. Mm -hmm. uh, but the free online boot camps that I've started are absolutely not just me. So these started as 12-week boot camps, and they've been mm -hmm. collapsed into a reasonably intense but still part-time six-week boot camp. Um, and this is built off of the free code camp curriculum. So, so they're a registered nonprofit. They're amazing. We could not do this without them and without their permission. Um, but also the good people, at, I'm, I'm pointing behind me like they're back mm -hmm. there, the good people at Class Central built a whole platform that lets us teach on. So like just really salt. And Ramon is my uh, my co-teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and he's he's just, the, oh, it's almost disgusting how lovely he is. Like the <laughs> learners love him and deservedly so. Cool. Yeah. So how, how what do you teach there? Is it like really the one-on-one of programming or is it more advanced concepts? Who who is your target audience here? So we uh this last uh this last cohort, which just ended about two weeks ago, I should get back to work on those. Uh, we had fifteen thousand unique learners across two tracks, learning either web development, which is HTML, CSS, uh, accessibility, really, really intro level, like first steps with programming, mm -hmm. uh, or across JavaScript. And again, that sort of first steps with JavaScript getting started. So um, really sort of introductory level, but we added some additional forums for peer support. We've got a, a very noisy Discord um, and then some live stream lessons and question and answer to get people unstuck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we've had such a, so I would have expected, oh, these will be beginners. Uh, we have backend devs who wanted to try out web development. We've got folks who don't want to go into tech, but they do want to build a website for their, for their business. Um, and the thing I was I, uh, I used to be a teacher and I used to be a linguist. Mm -hmm. um, and very selfishly, the thing I was, one of the things I was most excited about was the absolute range of the learners. We've got folks across every regularly inhabited continent um, and folks joining us in this massive, exciting range of first languages. Um, I was just so, so people who are learning from their phones, people who are learning from the, from the library computers. And I just really, really loved this loud, chaotic, and so lovely and so supportive group of learners all helping each other out. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. So I actually was thinking a little bit about um, learning on devices that are not <laughs> high end, right? Um, and uh, when, I, when, when I started university, um, I couldn't afford really 
high-end computer, not not even a normal computer, right? So I was on this, I got the I got one of those really cheap computers from somebody that, you know, gave it to me uh, for free. And uh, it was Good. a nightmare. It was a nightmare to work on that. And nowadays it's obviously not the case anymore. And I'm really happy about that. Uh, but I, I was wondering, what about, you know, people that I want to work on the phone or work to you know on on a tablet and you know i'm pregnant right now and <laughs> oh congratulations yeah, thank you how and, exciting and so, how scary yeah but it's also a really cool experience because i'm thinking like this is my third child so i know a little bit oh, you're, you're just fine you're like no it's not scary this happens <laughs> i know what's going to happen it's going to happen that i can't sit here and you know work on my com comfortable devices um, and so I tried a little bit to to work on my phone and work on the tablet and so on. And I still think it's really difficult. Um, how, what tools do your learners have? Um, to, did somebody? To do that? Did one of my friends talk to you about this? This the, I'm I'm deeply <laughs> suspicious. Um, so I'm going to try really carefully not to say too much. Um, okay. I'm working on a little side project around this problem um, because this is a problem I've been thinking about a lot. So right now, and if 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 our dear listeners, our dear viewers, are mm -hmm. oh gosh, what's the the noun? Um, our beloved audience, your beloved audience, mm -hmm. has a tool or has something in the space that I haven't seen yet. Please come and yell at me. Um, but right now, I'm not seeing really good tooling. I'm not seeing a good way to write to the web from mobile devices. Yeah, it's not there. Um, and this is an ethical problem for me. This is like an because right now we we hear people talking about the next billion users, and I love this. But in a lot of cases, we're seeing people who are accessing the web for the first time, and I love it and I live for it. But they're accessing the web on a lot of constraints. So they're usually on phones. They're usually mobile only is, is what mm -hmm. we'll call those kinds of learners. They may be accessing it in their third or fourth language because you're going to see global web primarily in English and French and Spanish. And, um, and they're often constrained to really, really challenging limits on their, like their actual access to broadband or to, mm -hmm. to mobile signal. Um, and that's something I've been thinking about a lot on the device level for this problem. If I, when I'm, I'm going to date myself terribly, but I got access to the internet when I was maybe 13 or 14. And the device I use to access the web, to, to read mm -hmm. the web, I could also write to the web. And we're effectively giving people this write-only access to the web through, through smartphones. And that just, that doesn't seem like enough to me. Yeah. So there's nothing great yet. And I don't think I've necessarily cracked it myself. Uh, but in the next couple of months, I would like to, I've got a little thing I'd like to launch to see whether yeah. or not that might be a good tool. Yeah, cool. I would be super interested in that. And I also yeah. think like nowadays, um, I'm, I'm actually... I should actually be the whole day on bad rest, um, <laughs> but the two weeks what ago. What are you doing? You should you should be doing this yeah, lounging. Yeah, I should right? Yeah, but um, so now I'm allowed to be up a couple of hours per day, which is which is great. But because I'm on this bad rest, right, and I only can lie down, I'm not allowed to sit. Actually, um, I experience all these accessibility problems that you know, a um, couple of you know disabled folks also are experiencing, and I'm like. Right now, I really understand how difficult it is if you can't, you know, type right, if you have like these mobile devices. Um, and I think there is really, there isn't a lot of, you know, there's so much space and there, and, and we should really be much more welcoming to people that can't, you know, sit on this nice computer, have their three monitors, right? The keyboard and the mouse. And it's really, I mean, it's really frustrating for me to write a blog post, to uh, make an update on Git, right? To uh, make a PR. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ignoring you. I'm just grabbing a book to see <laughs> yeah. if I book. It's so rude, isn't it? Just turning away. Uh, oh, heck, I must have hidden it somewhere. Um, but there's a really fantastic book from the late 90s that Tim mm -hmm. Berners-Lee wrote about, um, about, about the process of inventing the web. Um, and I've got sort of a tab in the book because he said, oh, okay, we had to sit down and we had to define 
the bare minimum, like what is the the minimum viable setup you need to access the web? Mm-hmm. And they said, oh, you need a you need some kind of CPU, you need some kind of monitor, some kind of display. And one of the things that they specified as necessary for the web was you're going to need a keyboard. And I, I think that's the the point that 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 sticks me again and again, where I, I think, but we've gotten past the need for a keyboard in so many other spaces. Yeah. It seems a bit lazy to have not gotten past it in in sort of the ability to do simple web development. Yeah, yeah. It would be so great. Like <laughs> I would benefit so much from it. And oh, just the yeah. guilt I've got right now, where I'm just like, yes, yes, I'll get back to work. I, pro-. um, but we do currently have learned. Well, in the last cohort, we had a number of learners who were accessing the course all via the via via smartphones, um, and you could really see where it was. So they would post, and we'd love love to see them post screenshots of their code to see, hey, where has this gone wrong? Mm-hmm. But it's going to be folks screenshotting their their phone screen and just the implication of how challenging it would be to write. I've tried it to write a bunch of CSS on your phone. Oh, the absolute, like the the strength these people have in their hearts not to throw yeah. it across the room. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, another question that came to my mind is now you have this experience of, you know, teaching really beginners um, and also in a, in a very, you know, in a different space. It's a space of yeah. you are, you know, like this, this teacher now and they're doing an, an online course. But I'm also very interested in how can we actually bring back or coming back to the managing position, right? How can we teach and mentor um, within team, right? How can we do that for juniors? How can we do that for mid uh, engineers? Um, Who mentors and teaches senior engineers? How is that all, you know, the dynamic in a team? Um, And I was wondering if you have like some experience around that and some thoughts around that topic as well. So I was really lucky. I was on a team several years ago now out at FutureLearn with, uh, oh gosh, Nikki, what's your surname? I'm so sorry. I swear I know it. I've just forgotten it because I'm a bad person. Um, And Belinda Seckington, who are both unreasonably brilliant and fantastic managers. And a lot of that work on that team was around because uh, Future Learn was a was a MOOC platform. How do we how do we encourage learning? How do we incentivize it? How do we balance it? Um, and really, what kind of landed for me is it's an ongoing conversation between the folks running these teams, the individual people. I think it may be one of those issues where there's just no one size fits all. It's a combination of saying, "Hey." We have these options. Here are some off-the-shelf learning experiences with starting a conversation and keeping up a conversation of what do you want to learn, what works for you, what's best for you. One thing that I've encountered a couple of times in my career, uh, which I've had a really, really hard time with, um, and my my opinion on it has really radically changed, is every now and again I'd meet somebody who's sort of mid-level or senior, so they've they've gotten themselves into a secure role. They're feeling okay with it. Um, and they they wouldn't be that excited about learning where they said, yeah, I just want to do my job, but I want to go home. And I think the first couple of times, because nobody tells you, but you're not going to start managing people and get it right, right away. I'm going to stay awake late tonight, absolutely obsessing over the ways I'm still not doing it right. But back then I was thinking, oh, how can I, how can I make this person care about their learning? Rrr. I'm and these days I think with the um with the world having gotten much more stressful. Mm-hmm. Um and me having hmm, me having been me having enough experience to see that I think now that I was wrong. Um, these days when I meet somebody who's like, well, I'd like to do my job, I'd like to do a good job at my job, and then I'd like to go home. I don't I don't really need to move up. I don't really want to stretch and learn more. I've gotten, yeah, like that seems increasingly chill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it might be cultural as well. I think um, I'm from the States originally. 
Um, and I think there's quite a bit more fear around employment in the States. Um, almost everybody can be fired at any time and that, that, that makes everything very exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and generally your, your health care is associated with your employment. Um, so I think I see when I was younger and, and based in the States, there was a lot more, oh, of course you have to keep learning. Of course you have to keep running. You have to progress. Otherwise something bad could happen. Um, and yeah, I think I've just gotten increasingly excited to see people set boundaries around where they put their learning and where they put their interests. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a very strange take for a teacher. Yeah. So actually I was talking to Kate Hicks um, just a couple of uh, weeks, oh, well days jealous. ago. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were talking about learning debt. And, um, and this whole topic brought us to something um, where I think, you know, learning is often something very externalized, right? Where you say, oh, I'm learning, let's say I'm learning React or now I'm learning Remix, right? So maybe the newest framework or, you know, a new, a new approach for DevOps or whatnot, right? So it's, it's something that's out of what you're doing right now. And it's a new technology, very technology oriented as well, whereby I think at the company, there are so many, a little bit more, um, how, how to call it, but informal or, you know, a little bit more um, tactic learning experience that you actually have every day, right? Which is, how do I communicate with this new person on, on the team, right? How do I, how do I understand parts of this code base? Um, can we change the architecture uh, for that without breaking something? And all of these are also learning experiences, which we are often not um, declaring, de- declaring as that, right? So we are not saying, oh, you know, um, Michaela today learned about new ways uh, to do this architecture for us or to refactor that code. Or, you know, she, did, she, she learned about how this API works over there that she hasn't worked about. Right? This is very often not, I, I don't think it's so visible in the learning experience than if I would say, oh, Michaela, sit down and learn React. <laughs> yeah. You know? And I think that's really valuable as well. Because even when you say somebody, see somebody saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to chill and do a good job. And it's so easy to generalize about brains and learning. So we say, oh, you know, what we know about learning. In so much as we've learned anything about learning, like self-assessment's messy, the study of I'm not nearly clever enough to have a good handle on neuroscience and learning. But um, there's actually a fantastic uh, researcher and author, Mm -hmm. Dr. Barbara Oakley, uh, who does a lot of work on learning how to learn. And she's been doing some work with uh, Zach Caceres, who's a programmer. Um, And they're... they're, I'm not going to tell talk out of turn, but I, I believe they may be launching a project around how we learn programming skills relatively mm-hmm. soon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, but we're primates in changing environments. Even if we don't think about it as learning, we are getting new situations and new stimuli. Just like you said, I've got a new teammate. I'm going to learn to work with them. Oh, I've got this API. Oh, I've finally understood what's going on under the hood. Regardless of whether or not we've set ourselves a mountain path to hike a declared learning journey, there's still learning happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that those chilled folks, how you call them, right? Maybe they have also more capacity to actually see things that are, you know, people that are very on their journey of, oh, I want to learn React and the latest, you know, whatever uh, technology comes out right now, maybe don't have the capacity to see, for example, oh, you know, now that the market changed a little bit, budget shifted, we have to work a little bit different with this team or, you know, how can we how can we make sure that our deadlines are, you know, approachable and so on. So, I, yeah, I think learning really happens in so many forms. And um, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm always really excited about that as well. So I think when folks aren't, I think resilience is undervalued in teams often. So we'll get folks who are like, oh, and, and it's exciting. Sorry, this isn't very confident or it is not very definitive, but I'm going to waffle about my biases as part of this. <laughs> okay. I really like thinking about resilience uh, in individuals and in teams as a, as a resource available. I don't like thinking of people as resources, but like someone being rested, somebody having the capacity, somebody 
being ready for a little tiny crisis or a little weird thing, that feels like a like a resource right there. Mm-hmm. But I think often we we really lean on productivity so hard. How can we get? Uh, what kind of developer experience tooling can we use to get? 20% more out of yada, yada. How can we make sure people are focused? How can we cycle our meeting? And we're so focused on developer productivity and, and the productivity of technologists. I think we often sacrifice that flexibility and that resilience of having somebody who's not under these productivity pressures to such a high degree. Like we learn better when we're chill. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think it brings us back also to um, there was this blue code, right? Um, people that are taking on yeah. responsibilities, right? Blue work, sorry, blue work. That was what it was called, right? Um, but people that are taking on some invisible work that are, you know, good for the team. And and so, yeah, I, I think um, this is also for, for teaching, mentoring, learning. I think this can be one thing. And obviously we shouldn't get outdated too much. And But I also think that... <laughs> Um, it's it's not changing every minute, you know. Like see, sometimes we believe, or we we are made to believe, or the storylines around tech. Oh my God, you know, if you're not doing every day something, and you what know, do you mean you're not using blank? And I'm yeah, like, look, exactly. I'm very old and I'm <laughs> very tired. Like I'm I'm good. And I think it's uh, totally fine, right? And there are a lot of technologies that I mean, if if you're working on PHP. You know, a lot of the web runs on PHP and it's still, you know, a good technology and it's okay. Um, like if you want to stretch yeah. a little bit, getting into some Laravel is really, really exciting. But if you write PHP, you can hang out and get better at the core stuff of what you do and do a good job. Like you don't have to run as hard as you can, as fast as you can forever. Yeah, I think there are... There are you know, good choices to make. And um, I'm definitely for growth and for learning. Uh, but sometimes people are just burning, you know, mental calories. <laughs> I learn so much. I mean, I, I'm actually a learner, right? I, I yeah. love to learn. But most of the stuff that I learned, <laughs> I never used, which is, it's not very productive, right? <laughs> yeah, but you can't not... Oh, sorry, you've invited me on here and I'm just up here ready to bully you. But I, yeah, this, this sort of cult of productivity, not, not that, that you're espousing it, makes me very, very... And when I talk to new learners and they say, oh, okay, I need to learn this and this and this and this and this and this. And I've heard these words and I need to learn this. I'm like, babe, you can, you can chill. We can all chill. Like we don't have to learn any frameworks yet. We don't have to learn any... Um, any ops yet, we can just chill and learn the core stuff. And as these, like one thing I really like to encourage, especially with new learners or learners new to a specific space, mm -hmm. um, is to go ahead and get some kind of digital or some kind of physical space where you can dump stuff. Um, some people like Notion. I hate Notion a lot. Um, I quite like Obsidian. I, I don't care what you use as long as you're happy about it. But as you're seeing all these terms, just chuck them in a big doc. So you say, okay, well, I, I keep seeing Angular. I know Angular's a thing. Should I learn Angular? Don't worry about whether or not you have to learn it next. Just go ahead and when you see an article about it, throw it in the slush pile. Um, I call it my link dump for early mm -hmm. learning. And that means once you've got through the foundational stuff, you say, okay, I've learned enough JavaScript where I can write. And I, I like setting these little tiny interim goals to say, well, I've learned enough JavaScript where I'm able to make uh, simple bug fixes in this open source project I was interested in. I've learned enough. And, and one thing I'm excited about is the, the art of learning code or the art of reading code, uh, which is something Felina over in, um, mm -hmm. is an academic who's, who's doing a lot of work Lighting in this space. University, yeah. Yes. You've talked to her already, I bet. I did my PhD with her in the same room. <laughs> did you? Yeah, did yeah. You? We were roommates. Yeah. Oh, is she just as delightful to study yeah, with? Yeah, she is wonderful. Um, but yeah, so so really getting through the basics of, well, I set out to do X, I'm doing X. Now it's time for me to go look through my link dump file and see, wow, it looks like I've got like 40 different articles about Angular. 
maybe that was important, that that's enough for, that I want to learn next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe something else that comes to my mind here is also that I think fundamentals are really important, right? So um, I like, for example, the approach of Dan Abramoff, right? He had like this course of just JavaScript, which it means that you're not starting with React, right? You're starting with JavaScript and with, with the fundamentals around it. And I, I wouldn't say it's really a course for really real beginners, yeah. but it's like if you if you got a little bit your hands dirty around JavaScript, it's really nice to go in and then check, did I actually really understand what's you know what's happening here? And then if you have these fundamentals, I think it's so much easier to build upon that dumb. And, uh, and and yeah, and, and dive into React or whatnot, right? Uh, whatever uh, yeah. framework or technology you want to add here. And I think this comes back to something I've been thinking about a lot in how we learn and teach. Um, but like where we abstract things out. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the in the boot camp, we're using Free Code Camp to teach, which is a it's a in browser sandbox. You don't have, and they've they've just come out with a new beta curriculum for web development, which I'm in love with. Mm -hmm. And it previews that these are files and that you have to link to these files. It's very very good. But it's still a sandbox. It's still an abstraction. And the places we tend to send learners next are things like, okay, we're going to head over to Code Sandbox. We're going to head over to Glitch, which are still abstracting away a lot of really... And then even when you look into professional tooling and frameworks, you say, okay, let's get into React. A lot of the power behind these frameworks are that they abstract away or that they compress or they obscure or, or smooth over some of the fundamentals of how we work with the core technology, maybe JavaScript or the way Tailwind is a weird abstraction of the things you'd like to do with CSS. And I don't, I don't have a problem with, I think as a teacher, I'd have a hard time having a problem with abstraction. Um, but I think that thinking really carefully about how we do this when we abstract things away and how we signpost what's been taken or what's been added gets to be really valuable. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. When I was starting to, to learn programming, I struggled a lot with abstractions because I just wanted to know, or not only with abstractions, but also like there wasn't a lot of abstractions. It was actually very, very raw, right? It was like, oh, you have an Eclipse IDE open and you're writing Java Java code. But then you have like, Oh, let's say you you know public void string main whatever right, and it's just like you just do it, <laughs> you just yeah. put it there right, and I'm like, but why? What does it mean? Don't worry about it. And this oh, we'll is cover so this hard. later. Yeah, it's so and hard. By the time to, we will have covered yeah. it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Having been a linguist, I I fear that I mentally map language learning to programming language learning, even when it might not be entirely suitable. Um, but I see this happening in in human language education as well, where we say, "Okay, cool. Here's so we we keep we start people in the present perfect tense for a lot of languages. I see the cat. I drink the water. I walk to the store. Um, and we don't send them into a present perfect world. And I think that's true with programming as well. To say, "Okay, well, we're going to give you this sandbox, or we're going to give you this framework, which abstracts away a lot of the." complexities of the grammar or the the nuance of and I think it's really valuable to talk about the culture of the language we use around programming and really the culture of of the structures we build because it's not transparent to people I met with a learner uh, in person what a delight uh, in person last week and without thinking about it I said yada da 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 bike shedding um, and thank goodness this learner was confident enough to be like, cool, what the heck are you talking about? It's like, oh, oh gosh, that's just something we say. We say it as though everyone's going to understand it. And it means to get sidelined, to get distracted with little unnecessary details. She's like, okay, cool. You should just say that. It's less complicated. Yeah, I think it's not always that easy to be always aware of how you do it. But I recall the time that I started at Microsoft. And, you know, when you start there, it's full of acronyms. <laughs> and they mean they mean something completely else in inside Microsoft than what it would mean outside, right? So uh, 
and and it really takes quite some time and then a lot of people get very blind to it and you know just start using it as well and you know you start talking this gibberish <laughs> nobody else can understand yeah but like from a linguistic perspective, that's because f- that identifies you as a member of the in-group, doesn't it? How fascinating. Yeah, what a yeah. incredibly interesting. Oh, no, no. I absolutely refuse to spend the next three days hyper-focused learning about weird Microsoft acronyms. <laughs> it's so tempting. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot. <laughs> but I think it, it's the same with code reviews, right? And with sometimes how people say, oh, you know, we have this style of giving feedback to each other. Um, And in my code review workshops, I always talk, you know, I always try to have people come to an agreement that we need to use language and also, you know, um, phrase that in a respectful way that's not only for the internal, you know, internal team to understand Uh, because there are newcomers, you know, in the team. Maybe somebody will look at that, what you're, wrote two years from now, right? And, and still should be able to understand it. And so I think it's really good if we um, be clear about those those bridges that we built that, you know, or this internal uh, behavior and, 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 and language that we are using that it's only, you know, it's an insider <laughs> joke and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And I, th- I think we're often really chill about that in text. The, oh, here's a glossary of technical terms you need to know to do the thing. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're cool about that. Um, and there seems to be a bit more resistance around when shared language or shared norms or shared l- language structures around things like code reviews are proposed because oh, we, we don't need that. We know how to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. Um I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. Are you one of those lucky people who speak like nine languages? <laughs> no, not nine, but I speak... Oh, only five. Maybe, yeah. German. <laughs> <laughs> German is my mother tongue, right? English, Dutch, Italian, a little bit of Spanish. <gasps> a little know? bit of Spanish. <laughs> Look at that. The, the, the fantastic thing about chatting to, to many folks from Europe is is y'all always have this very, very beautiful, very casual, like humble brag at the end. You're like... You know, just a, a little tiny bit of Croatian. It's, it's, I'm terribly jealous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like recognizing that folks are going to be coming to uh, coming to these code reviews. And I really liked that you highlight that they're going to be coming to them uncoupled in time. Mm-hmm. I love this idea that when you leave a code review, when you leave feedback, when you leave a pull request, when you leave code, you're leaving a little artifact of understanding behind. Mm-hmm. So to say, cool, we've standardized how we how we talk about these. We, we've created a shared language for them because when we go into the far scary future, we want these to still make sense. Yeah, I think this is really important. But also yeah. making them, like giving a shared language around, hey, maybe English or may, if if we're doing the if we're doing the the code review in Dutch I'm in a bit of trouble but maybe the language this code review is in uh, is your second or third or fifth let's go ahead and have some shared language have some shared structures around feedback to lower the cognitive load yeah Ooh, can we talk about cognitive load <laughs> I imagine you've done it tons of times on the pod. I, you know, I imagine many programmers are familiar with it. I'll show. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we also have to be a little bit um, uh, careful of the time now. But maybe the last thing um, that I want to add here is uh, I'm, I'm, I'm writing a, a book on code reviews, right? And so... Are you? Yeah. I'm right now in the middle of the feedback section, right? So how to give feedback, how to give respectful uh, feedback and how to communicate with each other and also cultural, right? So how do we deal with, and, and, and it gets really hairy there, right? So yeah. what are different cultures are expecting? What's respectful there? You know, how much, um, you know, how harsh <laughs> should a feedback be or can it be? Or, you know, what is seen as polite and so on. And this is not only, it's it's not only, it's not one standard thing, right? It depends on who's on the team, what's their background, what's the culture. Um, but I think the expectations, setting the right expectations and, you know, ex- explicitly stating that and talking about that, reflecting on that and, you know, 
learning how others see those things and learning how, you know, like if I would talk to you, I'm, I'm originally from Austria, lived in a couple of countries, right? You're from the States, you're, you're in the UK now, right? I am. Yeah. yeah. Uh, everything's just fine here. Very chill. Not yeah. weird. Yeah. <laughs> And, and then maybe we have another person from Croatia and then somebody from India, right? And so I think it would be really important for us to talk about how we understand different uh, terminologies, how we understand different, you know, expressions. Uh, in my Coterie workshop, sometimes I have discussions about looks good to me. And I, I oh, love those yeah. discussions because, I, you know, it's just a simple term looks good to me most of the time people just uh, you know have the acronym for it right like um, it's the thumbs yeah, up emoji thumbs, in my head isn't yeah, it yeah exactly like, or you know lg uh, tm right uh and then some people are like oh yeah this means you know that i looked through it and you did a good <laughs> job and then the other person is no you know, looks good to me means that you haven't looked at my code and you, you just, just glanced want, at it. Yeah, you just want it out of your way. You know, and the other person says, oh, this means I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, and having having those discussions in the team, you know, and understanding where everybody is coming from and that they actually use, you know, one simple terminology and everybody on the same team understood something else about it, I think is so valuable, right? Um, and only only by these discussions, you know, we can really understand what's behind those yeah, terms and, and the way that we are communicating at it. But yeah, I'm also getting a little bit carried no, away no. here. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you about your book. And yeah. I've just had a friend tell me mm -hmm. that there are some questions you're not supposed to ask about someone's book. So I, I won't ask any of those. <laughs> Instead, I've been told you're supposed to say, I hope it's going well. Um, I'd like, and I think it might be useful for hopefully some of the audience as well. Mm -hmm. I had an idea for a book that sounded really fun in my head. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I've, I've sort of broken it down into to chapters, into essays and trying to write a couple of chapters. And my goal in writing a couple of essays is I'm trying to talk myself out of writing a book. Yeah, I do, heard that. Yeah. Do you have any advice for for not write? <laughs> like, can it, it's the worst. It's the worst idea ever. No one wants to write a book. Like, please, please, please. <laughs> no, I don't have. <laughs> no, I don't, what are you doing? Yeah, but I saw that on Twitter that you said that, and I thought, like, yeah, you won't be able to not write a book with this approach, right? <laughs> it's, I love it's, how that sounds like a threat where you're like, you're gonna you're gonna write that book. <laughs> Yeah, it looks like. <laughs> I think if you're breaking it up in essays, oh it's, no, it's, that's it worse. Sounds not very better. manageable. <laughs> I think uh, you will write this book. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but but for our beloved audience, for your beloved audience, yeah. they shouldn't write a book. They should they should definitely do things that are not writing a book. Like it's a terrible idea, isn't it? Um, I can't I can't say it's a terrible. Are idea. you no, enjoying I, it? I, I I don't think it's a good idea. But there I think, we are. <laughs> Right. I think a lot of people would like to write a book and I would be the last person that would discourage them because I was always discouraged to write a book, right? Um, but I think I know what mess I got myself into. So I would That's just, what I'm looking for. I would there just we go. tell the people that you're getting yourself into a big mess, <laughs> but it's okay, you know? It's okay. I think people can write books and people should The world write is books. messy. It'll be yeah. fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, no. This is yeah. the opposite of what I was looking for, but it's so delightful. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jess, actually, this brings us to the end of our show. I really enjoyed talking with you about all of that. And I think we should talk about uh, cognition and cognitive load and, you know, all of that. So maybe I will invite you again. To another, you know, you know what? To another podcast I'd love to have. Session. I'd love to come back anytime. But I'll also pass you some contacts for for folks yeah. who are much better at this than I am. I will just go back and be like, so books, <laughs> uh, and really, your audience deserves better. Okay, and we will put all the things that we talked about um, down there. Also, maybe the Twitter handle or LinkedIn yeah. profile or whatnot from the person that you mentioned in the middle, where you forgot the, the last name. I put it there, so. She will be uh, there as well. And then, um, yeah. So uh, is there something that you want to to wrap this episode up or? Oh, gosh. Can I can I bully your audience? Is that is that doable? <laughs> is it permitted? Um, I've been doing advice calls all this week. And the big thing that I keep coming back to when I chat to people, uh, and I do do them just to, to be mean to people who are smarter than me, is 
right now, everything, everything is just so big and so loud and so stressful. Um, one thing I've really enjoyed exploring with people is looking at ways that what they have to do, what they think they have to do can be smaller and softer and quieter. And I think that, yeah, I'd love to gently bully folks to consider how what they need to do could be a little less. Maybe you don't have to write that book. It can just be an essay. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I actually did that this week with myself and just gave myself permission to let go of a couple of balls that I was juggling. And I think it's delightful. We should really do that. And I think it's it's the time that we, or many people need it. Not, not everybody, right? Not, I, I think a lot of people need it. So yeah. There's really, going to be one person out there who's having a real good week. I just haven't met him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or yeah, or that get very nicely distracted by all of the work <laughs> and don't have to think about <laughs> the other stuff that's going on. Yeah. Okay. So, Jess, thank you so much. Um, thank you. It was really a pleasure talking to you. Uh, thanks so much. I'll let you go. And thank you again. Yeah. I won't get into a thank you loop with you. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. This was another episode of the Software Engineering Unlocked podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, Please help me spread the word about the podcast. Send the episode to a friend via email, Twitter, LinkedIn, well, whatever messaging system you use, or give it a positive review on your favorite podcasting platform such as Spotify or iTunes. This would mean really a lot to me. So thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe and I will talk to you in two weeks. Bye.